Chapter Three: Finding the Super Soldier. The first thing the professors and Colonel Magnus had to do was name the program. For years, Dotan had been thinking of an appropriate name, and he suggested Talpiot. Talpiot has a few meanings in Hebrew, but its most popular definitions are sturdy strongholds or tall turrets. In the biblical Song of Songs, Talpiot appears as a metaphor for leadership. Though not religiously observant, many of Israel's early leaders were aware of the historic national significance of the Jewish homeland and took pride in their new state's connection to the Bible. To this day, biblical references are commonplace in Israeli public venues. The others agreed to the bold military title. In order to launch the program in a matter of months, they had to quickly come up with a viable program, a syllabus, a home, a university partner, appropriate facilities, a way to find and recruit students, and a way to test potential applicants. Dotan and Yitziv had both been insiders at Hebrew University for some time. The army held meetings with several of the top universities in Israel, including Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, and the Technion in Haifa. There was outright rejection at first. None of the three universities wanted soldiers on their campus. An early leader of Talpiot started to think the program would never get the backing of a university. One day, as he was speaking to a friend who was a secretary at Hebrew University, she asked him what was wrong. He told her the story, and she exclaimed. You haven't spoken to the right person. Two minutes later, she came back with the vice president of Hebrew University, Professor Yoash Vedia, who listened to the plan. He was so taken by it that he moved quickly to convince the board to broaden its scope, allowing Hebrew University to become the home of this new, mysterious, and top-secret army program. This was not the first nor the last time that an Israeli secretary knew more about making the right connections than the experts. It seems to be built into Israeli culture. Internal meetings following the decision at Hebrew University often descended to fighting over the content of the program and whether it would be academically rigorous enough. The university didn't want to hand out degrees to candidates they did not believe were worthy. Several generals, including some in the general staff, wanted to kill Talpiot in its infancy. They thought it would cost far too much money and it was too elitist. One of the IDF's many redeeming qualities is that it is the great equalizer in the nation. It didn't matter if you were smart or dumb, rich or poor. You were in the nation's army with people you might not ever normally come into contact. The IDF truly is an army of the people, a place where everyone is needed. The disgruntled generals felt that a program like Talpiot would turn that line of thinking on its ear, and they were vocal in their opposition. Colonel Magnus always defended the program. I was always straight to the point when people in the army said Talpiot wasn't necessary. I would always speak up, no matter who was on the other side. I would say we were important and the state needed Talpiot. I was constantly fighting with higher-ranking officers in the opening years, officers who were trying to squash our budget. There were numerous arguments. And to many generals, the thought of Talpiot becoming the army's top priority was abhorrent. They needed fighters. They needed motivated young Israelis to fly planes and drive tanks. They needed boots on the ground, and they needed to secure the nation from the sea. Talpiot's recruiters were forced to jockey for position, smashing elbows with other officers representing other elite branches of the army. There was infighting. There was subterfuge. Bad and conflicting advice was given to potential recruits. Fortunately, the first commander of Talpiot was an indomitable personality, Dan Sharon. His war experience had taught him that there was a need for such a program well before the idea began taking off. On the first day of fighting in the Yom Kippur War, Egyptian warplanes fired Russian-made Kelt missiles at his base. The Kelts were precursors to today's cruise missiles, boasting pinpoint accuracy. Major Sharon saw some of the reserve foot soldiers who were on his base come up with a quick way to defeat and deceive the Kelts by tapping into their Israeli radar systems that were on a similar frequency. I thought, why are these guys here? They should be at the Ministry of Defense. At this point, I knew we were wasting resources and needed to do better. Sharon was a long-time friend of Felix Dotan. They used to meet on Fridays for a spot of brandy. 
He was very eager to help Dotan, so when the program was finally accepted in 1978, Dotan asked him to lead Talpiot, and Sharon accepted. He had just completed his PhD dissertation at Hebrew University on the development of thinking and how one can improve his or her own thinking. In order to take the Talpiot position, however, the army had to reactivate him. They did so immediately with the higher rank of Lieutenant Colonel Sagan Aluf, executive officer of a brigade. Sharon looked to many places for help and advice. He'd never started a military unit before. Benny Peled, former chief of the Israeli Air Force and architect of the IAF's stunning defeat of the Egyptian and Syrian air forces in the Six Day War, offered his services. Sharon recalls, Peled was always very positive, but critical and cautious at the same time. He always had a very sharp mind. He said to me, "Listen, when you construct a bridge, you always leave a weak spot where you can destroy the bridge with one single stick of dynamite if necessary. Maybe we are making a mistake." So don't forget, in case this program is unsuccessful, you need to get out. Sharon quickly discovered there would be bumps on the road, particularly in finding the super soldiers he needed for Talpiot. He discovered that he was in competition with a pre-existing elite computer and communications eavesdropping unit called Unit 8200 or 8200. Its recruiters were active precisely where Talpiot hoped to attract candidates. It became clear to us when we came to the field the guys from 8200 were already there and already had recruited. An unpleasant situation developed, and I decided to solve this problem. There was a colonel in intelligence who was responsible for their training, Sasson Saik. At first, he didn't want to meet with me to discuss this issue, but ultimately he agreed. We sat in the Harley Cafe in Tel Aviv. I looked him straight in the eye. I told him this is about our existence here. Then I said, "Tell me, is it good for us to fight? Let's compromise. We'll find them together, and we'll ask each student what he wants. That's it. If you have one or two who are exactly for you, take them. But in the end, let the candidates do what they want." Like many things in Israel, that informal deal was sealed with a handshake, and the truce held. In the early years, top generals also argued that army recruits shouldn't be studying in a classroom, but Colonel Machnus made sure they were fighters first. He repeatedly pointed out to Talpiot detractors that our Talpiot recruits had Israeli Air Force uniforms, and I insisted there'd be an army unit, not students in the army. I ran it as a fighting unit. Dotan Yitziv and Colonel Machnus set the standards for admission and recruitment very high. In one of their original organizational memos, they wrote, "We need applicants with a high IQ. We are looking for the top five percent when it comes to intelligence, creative ability, the ability to focus, stable and pleasant personalities. These people will need to be in constant contact with the employees of research and development of the Ministry of Defense, combat officers and professionals, scientists in institutions of higher education, and engineers and technicians in the institute where they'll work." Applicants must have dedication to their homeland and the strong will to survive in the unit. That is clearly not an easy shopping list, especially when the new unit had to compete with special forces units and the Israeli Air Force, which had similar requirements. Both had two huge advantages over Talpiot. First off, every potential recruit had heard of both, and the smartest and most able students had long strived to join them. Everyone knew that the training, connections, and prestige of belonging to those units would later help them in their post-army careers. Nobody had ever heard of Talpiot, not even some of the army's top officers, let alone the recruits. Existing units had the added advantage of public image. Army service in Israel was and is still, though to a much lesser extent, seen as a coming of age when boys turn into men and girls become young women. Most 17 and 18-year-olds don't want to sign up to study. They want to fight. They want to impress girls with their special insignias and berets. They want to be seen as men protecting their nation. To many, sitting in a classroom is like sitting on the bench. They want to be in the game. Yet many of the top Israeli recruits would quickly find they didn't have a choice of where they'd go anyway. Chief of Staff Eitan wanted to make Talpiot a priority, and he was going to get as many generals on board as possible to make it happen, even if the recruits had never heard of Talpiot. 
A few years after the programme was created, it became common knowledge among senior officers in the IDF that Tolpiot would be given the right of first refusal regarding all enlistees in the armed forces. If you were accepted into the training program for Air Force pilots, but Talpiot's commanders wanted you, you would go to Talpiot. You could be a fighter pilot later, but first you were going into Talpiot. The founders were working under the theory, backed up by research, that they could only use young men and later women of a young age because they believed creativity and proclivity to believe anything is possible peaks in the early twenties. If the young recruits wanted to do something in the army in addition to Talpiot, that wouldn't be a problem. But Talpiot must come first. Recruiting in those first years was rudimentary. Army human resources officers would gather data about potential candidates from other recruitment officers through a large database. But because Talpiot didn't know exactly what criteria to judge, it was not an easy process. Talpiot recruitment officers would also go to schools, mostly in Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Haifa, to talk to school principals and tell them a little about the program, hoping they could connect and find appropriate candidates about to graduate high school and enlist in the army. But this was far from a scientific process, and many capable students and candidates living outside of Israel's three main cities were left out of the mix. It took the IDF years to figure out how to equalize the recruitment process and cover the nation's smaller and less wealthy areas. Still, finding the right recruits was a problem. Dotan and Yitziv began working on criteria to help them make sure the right candidates were applying and being accepted. In the early years, they wanted to isolate candidates who would be able to deal with a lot of new physics and mathematics material in a short amount of time. Understand it to the degree that they could apply it to actual projects, achieve a bachelor's degree, and absorb the material usually given to exceptional students in a four-year period in just three years. The original tests for Talpiot tested both cognitive function and creativity. Later, a component designed to test for future success in a team environment was added. The entry tests were devised by experts in both math and physics. In addition, psychometric tests were devised to test for intelligence, the ability to learn new subjects, and of course, personality traits. The students taking the tests in the early years of Talpiot recruitment were often puzzled. They had never been in this position before. These were personal questions, not questions they had expected. How do you feel about yourself? How do you feel when you don't do as well as you had hoped on an assignment? Do you feel nervous when addressing a group? After those first tests, the pool of several hundred applicants had to be whittled down to several dozen. Now things really got interesting. A few months before the enlistment date, candidates were called in for personal interviews. One by one, they were called into a room. The seventeen-year-old high school student would sit before a panel of eight to ten people, many of whom were high-ranking army officers, head of the IDF from the Defense Ministry's research and development arm, Mafat. There will be more at the end of this chapter on Mafat, which helps oversee Talpiot in conjunction with the Israeli Air Force. More importantly, representatives of Mafat are later very influential in analysing the Talpiot graduates and in aiding in their choice of where they will serve in the army after they graduate from three years of intense coursework. The personal interview part of the testing phase usually lasted about thirty minutes. The panel scrutinised how the candidate acted under pressure. How poised and creative he was, how he fielded questions, and his ability to communicate with older, more powerful, and more sophisticated men. The interviewing committee became known as the Character Acceptance Committee. There were many levels to the interview, but staples included asking candidates questions regarding math and physics to find out how well the potential candidates could understand new material. In some cases, they were given material to read, then quizzed. They were asked seemingly simple questions to find out how much they enjoyed learning about science and how curious they were. Questions may have included "How does an airplane fly?" and "How does a refrigerator work?" Hagai Skolnikov, a Talpiot graduate, reflected on the grueling test phase, particularly the committee interview. It seemed to him that they were looking for leadership and a candidate's ability to take on difficult tasks, technological leadership, in effect. For instance, they ask you to explain physical phenomena which are likely well beyond what anyone ever studied in school, and to do the best you can with a question you won't know the real answer to. 
They want to know: Can he think outside the box? They're nice, but they're also intense about it. You know, this is no joke when you're surrounded by professors and high-ranking army officers. In one case that has become legend, after being asked about his hobbies, a candidate spoke during his interview about his love of playing music. He compared his fascination with composing music to his love and interest in physics. He was then asked how he might use both of these interests to create the perfect sound. The young man described his guitar in great detail and then explained how he might use a series of connections to amplify the sound. After the candidate left the room, one of the commanders conducting the interview slapped himself on the head and said to the other interviewers, "I've been trying to build an electric guitar for my son." He just explained exactly what has been missing. Another candidate's interview didn't go quite as well. The lad was asked if he was a Zionist. He answered, "I love Israel, but I will probably take what I learn in this program and apply it to professional pursuits outside of the country." That man didn't make the cut. When his father found out, he marched the boy back to some of the men on the interview committee and told them his teenager didn't know what he was talking about, and of course he was a Zionist who wanted to help his country forever. The surprised members of the committee swore to the father they actually liked his answer. The kid had been honest, but there were other reasons they claimed why he wasn't accepted. Several Talpiot graduates also said they were asked different formations of this question. How many gas stations are there in Israel? Most of them said they'd estimate the population, then divide it into an assumption of how many cars are on the road in Israel, and they'd try to devise some sort of logical and mathematical equation. But to a man, all laughed about it later, saying they now understood the committee wasn't looking for an accurate answer. They simply wanted to see how potential recruits acted under stress and how they thought through problems. When a young woman going through the testing told the committee she spoke Italian, they were impressed, for Italian is not a language many Israelis learn to speak. Upon hearing this, one member of the committee asked her, "How many people have seen Michelangelo's statue David in the Galleria dell'Accademia in Florence?" Another candidate, who ultimately succeeded and gained acceptance to Talpiot, says, "I was told, 'Give me the name of a scientist that you look up to and would like to emulate.'" I thought to myself, "Don't pick Einstein! Don't pick Einstein! Don't pick Einstein!" But I panicked, and Einstein it was. I then proceeded to pretty much make up an answer, but the key was to sound confident and competent. They all probably laughed at me after I left the room. Another successful candidate found the mind games very stressful. He had been asked, "What is a black hole, and how does it work?" He recalls, "To be honest, I really thought that maybe they didn't exactly know either." While some high school Talpiot candidates regard these psychological tests and personality profiling stimulating, and others find it stressful, the personal interview, the student versus the committee, remains an invaluable part of the testing today. It is a rite of passage and still the cornerstone of Talpiot selections. Yet, in the opening years of the program, heavy concentration on psychological stamina and academics seems to have been overplayed. Talpiot recruiters came under criticism for not finding team players. One of the most famous Talpiot graduates is a man named Eli Mintz. He characterizes the early Talpiot people as very strange. It was twenty eccentric nerds put together and then told by army officers, who often had no idea what we were working on or how we were doing it, to get along. Getting along proved to be a formidable challenge to many of those super smart teens. Mintz confesses, like many others in the program, I had come from environments where I thought I was always the smartest. So when you're finally in a room where you think, "Wow, I'm not the smartest guy in the room," it was great. It was a new challenge, but not everyone was programmed to think like that, and it led to personality problems. He reflects that learning to work with others who are smarter than he was the most important thing Talpiot had taught him. Those personality problems would soon be addressed. After a few years, Talpiot recruiters added a crucial new phase to the process. They wanted to see which candidates could work well as a group under challenging conditions. To this day, new recruits are measured in this part of the testing by former Talpiot graduates. Specifically, these tests can consist of working with team members to come up with a proposal for as many ways to use a bicycle or a shoe they can think of. 
Others are asked to design something as a team. Some tests include using children's building blocks to construct something. All of this is happening under tight deadlines, sometimes in hot rooms. To add tension and pressure to the situation, former Talpiot graduates are lurking behind, recording every move and every word, or at least the candidates are made to feel like that's what's happening. By the sixth or seventh year, recruiting became more formalized. Professor Yativ and Dotan knew who they were looking for and how to find them. And by then, they were actual Talpiot graduates with a bigger say in the program. That was so valuable because their tangible experience led to practical revisions in the Talpiot selection process. In fact, a good number of changes took place during the early years in both the vision and development of Talpiot as its founders struggled with practical concerns and unforeseen problems. In the opening stages of Talpiot, Professors Yatsev and Dotan weren't quite sure where they wanted to take the program, according to Talpiot graduate Amir Shlachet. They envisioned a Palo Alto research center similar to the one set up and developed by Xerox. They wanted to take young people and put them in a research institute and have them think of ways to come up with new weapons, emphasizing breakthrough technologies. Initially, they intended the graduates would stay together forever at the research center. But in the first year, Talpiot commanders realized the idea had to change because there were simply not enough resources to make it happen in a country as small as Israel. You can't just build labs and think tanks in Israel. We don't have the resources. So instead, they said, we'll train them and send them to places where R&D infrastructure already exists, namely in the army, air force and navy, and also with Israeli defense contractors. For Talpiot to work, it would take resourcefulness, dedication and the humility to revise the original plan. And none of these qualities were beyond its founders, particularly Felix Dotan, according to Amir Peleg of the 5th Talpiot class. He describes the professor as the real driving force behind the program. Dotan was very proud of being one of the first to say that something needs to be done to create a program like this. He was such a relaxed, nice guy not too dogmatic and always genuine. He really cared about Talpiot, about the army and about Israel. And he did the best he could to turn his vision into a reality. Professor Dotan could not have forged Talpiot without the vigorous support and cooperation of Mafat. Because Talpiot and Mafat are intertwined, it is important to understand the nature of this important facet of Israel's military. Early on, when the state was created, Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion wanted to keep the fighting men and women separate from the men and women who would control the money and the budget. He knew the army would play a large role in the makeup and development of the nation, but he wanted to separate the guns and the money in order to maintain a balance of power and to disable any future general from controlling both the army and the budget at the same time. In Israel, the Ministry of Defense is generally operated by civilians who control the budget for military spending, and the IDF is run by Israel's generals. Mafat is the Hebrew acronym for Administration for the Development of Weapons and Technological Infrastructure. The special department that was the precursor to Mafat was just in the beginning stages of working together with Israel's defense contractors when the Yom Kippur War broke out. That new research and development department had little to do with the fighting. During those three hard weeks of war, the head of research and development, Uzi Elam, had taken over this crucial unit only a few weeks before the fighting began. And like most Israelis, he really had no idea the war was coming. During the war, he lent out his staffers to different army units to help in any way they could. Yet, he retained a core research and development team in case an assignment came their way. Mafat was officially established in the early 1980s by Defence Minister Ariel Sharon. He envisioned it as an umbrella for all things R&D in the Israeli military. The new department also had a foreign relations unit that was tasked with buying and selling weapons abroad. Mafat's main goal was, and still is, to develop the Israeli defence industry all the Israeli contractors, large and small, and get them on one page in order to work more closely with the Israeli Ministry of Defense. When Talpiot was founded, Mafat soon took on leadership and administration of the program. 
Filled with some of the brightest engineering and military management minds in all of Israel, Mafat has the final say on who gets into the program and who doesn't. Though the Air Force is directly responsible for the cadets' military training on a day-to-day -day basis, Mafat is involved in the education of Talpiot students every step of the way. It helps nurture Talpiot's young cadets by taking responsibility for their training and coursework. Within the organization, there is a special team known as the Steering Committee that drives the program from the outside. Headed by the man or woman serving as deputy to the chief scientist of Mafat, this committee meets several times a year to evaluate and tinker with Talpiot, changing or updating courses as needed. Talpiot's commanding officer and a representative of Hebrew University also sit on the steering committee. Sometimes a select number of Talpiot graduates are also invited, as well as other representatives from Israeli defense contractors or high-ranking officers in the Israeli ground forces, Navy and Air Force. The committee is also responsible for coming up with strategies to decide where each soldier will serve after graduation. From its inception, one of Mafat's many missions is to supply Israel with a never-ending line of highly educated, highly motivated and like-minded soldiers who will better arm and protect Israel. Taking a vital role in the development and administration of Talpiot fulfills that mission. Chapter 4 – Polishing the Program one of the many reasons for the overwhelming success of the Talpiot program is the open-mindedness of the officers who run it. Yes, there's a bureaucracy, but when it counts, the army knows how to do the job right. Flexibility and tolerance for trial and error are key in honing a program that's part academic, part hardcore warrior training, and partly responsible for developing weapons and intelligence tools of the future. From the start, the founders of Talpiot were men of science, and they knew that making mistakes was part of advancement. And the army was quick to realize that Talpiot's officers and soldiers needed flexibility to try new things. Sometimes they'd achieve success, and sometimes they wouldn't, but it was clear nobody should fear failure. From the program's inception, Talpiot's student soldiers were instilled with a sense that making a mistake is perfectly acceptable as long as you learn from it. That kind of mental freedom is a prerequisite for true creativity, and creativity is the key to innovation. As the program matured into its sixth year, it became clear that the students were sometimes more learned in some ways than their instructors and senior officers. The Ministry of Defence began looking for someone to take charge who understood the cadets better. In order to find the right person, they looked inward. Ophir Shoham, an outstanding graduate of the second class of Talpiot, recommended to the IDF and the Ministry of Defence that a former member of Talpiot was best suited to lead it. They asked him if he had anyone in mind. He immediately recommended his friend and fellow member of Talpiot's second class, Ophir Yaron. Yoron is from Kiryat Bialik, just north of Haifa. After enlisting in Talpiot and getting his degree from Hebrew University, Yoron spent five years in Israel's communication corps, improving Israel's existing networks, making them more flexible, efficient and more secure. When asked, officials at Israel's Ministry of Defense would only say that Yoron's work was groundbreaking and still classified, even three decades later. Despite the advancements in communications that Yuan had developed, he was still unsure about what his next step would be. He wanted to stay in the army and extend his time serving the country, but he was looking for a new challenge. When Shoham approached Yuan about leading Talpiot, he thought, It's an interesting opportunity. I want to do more than just technical work. I want a chance to work with people rather than just things. Moreover, he strongly agreed with Shoham that Talpiot would be best served by a graduate who knew the program and the capabilities of the recruits. I felt I could relate to them. They were very smart, very confident in themselves. They think they know everything and that their way is the right way, so it's hard for them to accept authority sometimes. I was that at 18, and I'd have the same experiences. So I thought it would be good for the program, for the recruits, to relate to a graduate. He took over the program in its seventh class in 1985. 
After studying other successful educational programs, he was inspired by American Ivy League schools that not only had great academic programs but could also brag about their great traditions. The seventh year of a program is too early to have a true tradition, but Euron knew that Tolpiot was capable of establishing a tradition that would be the envy of other IDF units and academic programs in Israel. And fostering such tradition was crucial, he reflects, because the early excitement for the program was starting to wear off. There was a leveling off of resources for Talpiot. When I came in, I wanted to reinvigorate the program, to create a new tradition where it would be known as a unit and a part of the army that was constantly innovating. Yaron didn't want to make immediate and dramatic changes for the sake of making change. He believes that often a mistake made by new chief executives in the business world. Instead, he wanted to build on what had already been established and enhance it. In the year before Yaron arrived, Talpiot had started recruiting women. Six females were drafted in 1984, none in 1985, and three in the eighth class. As commander of Talpiot, Yaron never tried to recruit women differently from the way he recruited young men. We simply sought the best people. The women who were recruited wanted the full program, though typically high school girls do not want to commit to the army for ten years. We quickly found out it was not a problem for the women we were considering, he recalls. For most basic training programs in the Israeli army, men and women are separated, as they're usually in single-sex units. But in Talpiot, the men and women in the same class go through drills equally and together. That means long runs and difficult hikes, shooting courses, parachuting school, obstacle courses and beyond. Marina Gundlin, 26th class of Talpiot, admits, I was mostly nervous about boot camp. But I talked myself into it, saying to myself, if other girls can do it, I can. Talpiot is a long program, of course, and a lot of people don't make it all the way through. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to make it until I was in for six or eight months. By that time, I had built up enough confidence. Thirteen students dropped out of my class. These were people who were quite capable of doing advanced physics, but Talpiot was just too difficult for them. With Talpiot's high dropout rate, Keeping female recruits was especially hard. Yaron recalls that with one undecided female recruit, I wanted her to join, but I tried not to pressure. She did join. She was the lone woman in the class and wound up dropping out. I felt very bad about it. He remained the leader of Talpiot for two years before handing over the reins to another graduate. In fact, from the time Yaron took over, with one exception, for a short period of time, only Talpiot graduates have led the program since. His bold move in accepting the job set an enduring precedent. Two of the program's most innovative Talpiot commanders were Lieutenant Colonel Avi Poleg, Yaron's direct successor, and Major Amir Shlachet, a man who would later go on to major success at Israel's largest bank, Banker Poalim. Poleg grew up in Haifa in the 1970s. As a teenager, he was quiet, curious and studious. He was also a musical prodigy, a cellist. Once a week, he'd commute two hours to Tel Aviv for cello lessons. He clearly remembers the trauma of the Yom Kippur War and always wanted to help his country. But because of a few health problems, he knew he'd never be able to serve in a combat role. When he was asked to apply for Talpiot in 1981, he had never heard of it before, like most of the enlistees of those years. The program hadn't been publicized, for it was regarded as a military secret. In Israel, military secrets are closely guarded, even in families and circles of friendships. People simply know not to ask too many questions. Since nobody had yet graduated from the program in early 1981, there was nobody to ask about what happens inside of it. He had to trust his gut. He became a member of the third class of Talpiot and never looked back. After graduating from Talpiot's academic program, he was picked by the Navy to develop electro-optics for ships, first working on devices designed to deceive enemy radar and missiles, then on developing infrared and thermal cameras to detect ships, weapons, missiles and any other kind of imaginable threat. A decade after enlisting in Talpiot, Poleg became its leader, in charge of day-to-day -day operations. His field work in the Navy helped him get to this position, one he had coveted for some time. A former superior at the Ministry of Defence said of him, It was really perfect for Avi. 
First off is a sincere patriot. He also has a real understanding of physics, and perhaps most important was his interest in the field of education. During the 90s, Israel's military technology was moving forward at a rapid pace, and Talpiot students and graduates were playing an outsized role in developing these technologies. Many of them, including cellular phone technology and data encryption, would soon have major civilian uses. As the army's needs were changing, Talpiot's officers had to make adjustments to the list of desirable qualities in candidates. Teamwork was becoming a bigger part of the equation because different kinds of systems had to be integrated into different units. Each year, picking the right 20 or 25 people was becoming more and more important. Suddenly, we had to start looking for a new combination of attributes, Pollig said. In addition to high cognitive scores and scientific thinking, they were looking for people who could lead. Officer testing and personality exams became crucial. Pollig revamped two parts of the exam: the group test and the interview. I wanted to check motivation, moral value, and of course personality. We would run intense social simulations in which the candidate was put into a high-pressure leadership position. How do you try to motivate your classmates who might be falling behind? How do you deal with those who refuse to take part in a certain project or activity? My goal here was to see how candidates coped with social issues, leadership issues, and paying attention to everyone. I needed to be confident that the candidates I picked would be creative, intelligent, inventive, with the ability to move from one area to another and be able to take leadership in a group while being part of that group. It was also critical to get a sense of how cadets might act when having to deal with someone above them and below them. Finally, I also needed a sense of their moral values and willingness to make a contribution to their country and society. I was always confident I could move the right students forward, but they have to take the roots. The trick was distinguishing who did and who didn't. In the committee interview, Pollig might say. Tell me something interesting that you saw last month that you didn't know. What you learned about it and how you increased your knowledge. Maybe an interesting instrument, an interesting science program you watched on television, an interesting article you read about science. This was the starting point, and he would use it to find out the level of the candidate's curiosity and how far he'd go to satisfy that curiosity. I was looking to see if the candidate made a real effort to investigate. Pollig also refined the process of assessing the candidate's ability to think. Famously, he would give them a sophisticated article from a science journal about something he was confident the recruit didn't understand and had not studied. The recruit would quickly read the article and then was asked a series of questions about it. The goal was not to test him on his knowledge, but to observe his thinking process. Pollig believed that an incisive committee interview gave him the best sense of the candidate, well beyond test scores. In one memorable instance, a candidate had not done particularly well on the previous testing, but Pollig gave him a simulation. He started to flourish. He was so enthusiastic and really animated. I would do this and I would do that. It was as if he was suddenly conducting an orchestra, as if he had found his voice right then and there in front of the committee. This was exactly the answer I was looking for. He has it. I viewed the committee in part as a trainer to pull something out of a candidate, and I used similar methods as a commander and educator once those potential recruits were in the program. Of course, there is no foolproof way of picking the best cadets for Talpiot, as Pollig had projected. Social testing took on increased importance in the late 1990s and earliest years of the 21st century. It is generally accepted that no Talpiot commander should stay in the same position for too long. By 2003, the timing was perfect for new ideas and new leadership, and Amir Shlachet became commander of Talpiot. By the time Shlachet was planning his army career at the age of 16, the veil of secrecy over Talpiot was starting to lift, and the program had become known throughout the country. Soon, it became a top priority for any young Israeli who was interested in physics, science, and math, and was able to achieve a high academic status. In many ways, students who target admission to Talpiot are akin to students in the United States who want to go to Harvard, MIT, Princeton, or Yale. At the age of 17, joining Talpiot wasn't exactly Shlachet's life's goal. 
but as he made it further and further through the labyrinth of exams, he became more and more interested and more hopeful that he'd make the cut. I knew I wanted to do cool stuff. I knew engineers and physicists. I didn't really know what research and development was, but I liked the idea of merging science and defence. After his three years of coursework, he graduated with his degree in science and physics from Hebrew University. He was placed in an Air Force Research and Development Unit by the Talpiot Commanders and Ministry of Defence and worked in a special unit developing airborne electronic systems using communications, radar and air-to-air -air and air-to-ground targeting. As he was finishing his Talpiot service, he was ready to pursue an advanced degree and then move to the world of business. But an Israeli Ministry of Defence legend and Talpiot graduate, Eviatar Matania, a man who would later be known as the right hand of Talpiot, asked Shlachet to stay. Matania recognised something extra special in Amir Shlachet. He saw a man who understood the need for Israel to be ahead of the curve in technology, a great project manager and an officer who could get everyone together to push toward a common goal. Matania offered him the chance to command the entire day-to-day -day program and to revitalise it. Shlachet immediately accepted and put his business career on hold, indefinitely. With ruthless honesty, he assessed every feature of Talpiot, looking at the entire program from above. If something added value, we wanted to strengthen it. If it was weak, we wanted to drop it. We changed the software for aggregate numbers crunching. Talpiot keeps evolving, and to a large extent, so does the screening process. One of Talpiot's biggest strengths is that we do our own screening, so we wanted to improve and intensify that. We redesigned the entire process. We are never on lockdown, and that's a tremendous strength. Breathing new life into the program, Shlachet upgraded the position of top officer to a Talpiot graduate and gave him more responsibility. He stays for a few years, not just one year, before moving on to something or shipping out from the army. We didn't want to invest extra training in future leaders and then have them leave after just one year, Shlachet explains. While still heading Talpiot, Shlachet persuaded a former class commander to stay after his time in the army was up. Doror ben Eliezer was given a three-year role as head of admissions under Shlachet. Doror is one of the few Talpiot graduates who also had a brother in the program, Barak. They had grown up together inside the old city walls of Jerusalem, playing American football with yeshiva students from the United States. Barak would later use many of the management techniques he learned in Talpiot and apply them to Israel's police force. Shlachet is a very humble man, as are most Talpiot graduates. He begrudgingly admits that colleagues and other Talpiot graduates might be right when they said, Amir breathed new life into the program, revamped it and made it better. What he is most proud of is that he revolutionised the screening process, which was in a transitional phase at the time. As the testing tilted increasingly towards social and personality factors, he actually came up with a better way to find out who is right and who is not right for the programme. The quiet tests, where candidates don't know what they're being tested for or that they're being tested at all, reveal a good deal thanks to psychometric advisors. These are third-year Talpiot students chosen on the basis of commander's recommendations and Talpiot graduates who have gone through special certification to participate. Marina Gundlin became a proctor for the social tests given to the prospective Talpiot cadets. She describes the group tests that are given over two days. We split them into teams and ask them to build something out of paper or out of blocks to see how they interact with each other. I don't want someone telling the other people what to do and what not to do. I don't want people who are rude or too pushy. No violence and no shouting. Those are definitely signs you're not right for Talpiot. I know it sounds funny, but you can easily tell who's good and comfortable and who has ideas about how to get the project completed and also who can get others on his or her side to complete the project. We watched them move forward with their projects right in front of them. There are no two-way mirrors or anything like that, just 10 or 12 people in a room working and two or three Talpiot graduates watching them to see how they behave. When asked what makes Talpiot so unique when compared with engineering or physics programs in other armies, Shlachet gives three reasons. 1. The fine-tuned selection process. 2. 
unique training, both academic and military, with emphasis on the big picture, and three, success in finding the right position for the graduate to serve. This last factor is critical, both to the Talpiot graduate and to the country. Talpiot officers work to build job descriptions for positions in research and development that are high on the priority lists of the Army, Navy and Air Force. We want them to be interested in the things they'll be doing after graduation, says Schlachet, because hopefully they'll be doing those jobs for at least five years. If they're interested, they'll be even more motivated. The solutions we're working on for the IDF aren't trivial. For some, the work will be the difference between life and death. We work on placement of each graduate during their entire three years of study. Our goal is to put each Talpiot graduate in a position where he or she will have maximum impact. Schlachet points out that one of the strengths of the Talpiot experience is that it is collaborative. Somehow, it is not competitive in any way. In fact, it is one of the least competitive places I've ever worked in. People help others even if it means they get a lower grade or do less on something. It's fantastic. Very close ties are built, maintained and kept forever. Despite the fact that Talpiot graduates have taken responsibility of day-to-day -day operations of the program, there are still people above them from Israel's Ministry of Defense, particularly insiders at Mafat, the Israel Defense Forces Research and Development Arm. Throughout the selection process, administration of the program and placement of graduates, these career army officers make sure Talpiot gets what it needs and the Talpiot gives back what the army needs from them. A high-ranking member of the Israeli Ministry of Defense, who would not allow his name to be used, pointed out that the unique thing about Talpiot is that it continues to reinvent itself, stay ahead of the times and improve itself. Part of that is because the graduates care so much and they're somehow constantly able to leave something better behind. It would be great if the rest of the country were like that as well. ...back with the Vice President of Hebrew University, Professor Yoash Vedia, who listened to the plan. He was so taken by it that he moved quickly to convince the board to broaden its scope, allowing Hebrew University to become the home of this new, mysterious and top-secret army program. This was not the first nor the last time that an Israeli secretary knew more about making the right connections than the experts. It seems to be built into Israeli culture. Internal meetings following the decision at Hebrew University often descended to fighting over the content of the program and whether it would be academically rigorous enough. The university didn't want to hand out degrees to candidates they did not believe were worthy. Several generals, including some in the general staff, wanted to kill Talpiot in its infancy. They thought it would cost far too much money and it was too elitist. One of the IDF's many redeeming qualities is that it is the great equaliser in the nation. It didn't matter if you were smart or dumb, rich or poor, you were in the nation's army with people you might not ever normally come into contact. The IDF truly is an army of the people, a place where everyone is needed. The disgruntled generals felt that a program like Talpiot would turn that line of thinking on its ear, and they were vocal in their opposition. Colonel Machnes always defended the program. I was always straight to the point when people in the army said Talpiot wasn't necessary. I would always speak up, no matter who was on the other side. I would say we were important and the state needed Talpiot. I was constantly fighting with higher ranking officers in the opening years, officers who were trying to squash our budget. There were numerous arguments. Tell me, is it good for us to fight? Let's compromise. We'll find them together and we'll ask each student what he wants. That's it. If you have one or two who are exactly for you, take them. But in the end, let the candidates do what they want. Like many things in Israel, that informal deal was sealed with a handshake and the truce held. In the early years, top generals also argued that army recruits shouldn't be studying in a classroom. But Colonel Machnes made sure they were fighters first. He repeatedly pointed out to Talpiot detractors that our Talpiot recruits had Israeli Air Force uniforms and I insisted there'd be an army unit, not students in the army. I ran it as a fighting unit. Dotan Yitziv and Colonel Machnes set the standards for admission and recruitment very high. In one of their original organizational memos, they wrote, We need applicants with a high IQ. We are looking for the top 5% when it comes to intelligence, creative ability, 
the ability to focus, stable and pleasant personalities. These people will need to be in constant contact with the employees of research and development of the Ministry of Defence, combat officers and professionals, scientists in institutions of higher education and engineers and technicians in the institute where they'll work. Applicants must have dedication to their homeland and the strong will to survive in the unit. That is clearly not an easy shopping list, especially when the new unit had to compete with Special Forces units and the Israeli Air Force, which had similar requirements. Both had two huge advantages over Talpiot. First off, every potential recruit had heard of both, and the smartest and most able students had long strived to join them. Everyone knew that the training, connections and... Chapter 3 Finding the Super Soldier the first thing the professors and Colonel Magnus had to do was name the programme. For years, Dotan had been thinking of an appropriate name and he suggested Talpiot. Talpiot has a few meanings in Hebrew, but its most popular definitions are sturdy strongholds or tall turrets. In the biblical Song of Songs, Talpiot appears as a metaphor for leadership. Though not religiously observant, many of Israel's early leaders were aware of the historic national significance of the Jewish homeland and took pride in their new state's connection to the Bible. To this day, biblical references are commonplace in Israeli public venues. The others agreed to the bold military title. In order to launch the program in a matter of months, they had to quickly come up with a viable program, a syllabus, a home, a university partner, appropriate facilities, a way to find and recruit students, and a way to test potential applicants. Dotan and Yitziv had both been insiders at Hebrew University for some time. The army held meetings with several of the top universities in Israel, including Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University, and the Technion in Haifa. There was outright rejection at first. None of the three universities wanted soldiers on their campus. An early leader of Talpiot started to think the program would never get the backing of a university. One day, as he was speaking to a friend who was a secretary at Hebrew University, she asked him what was wrong. He told her the story, and she exclaimed, You haven't spoken to the right person. Two minutes later, she came, and to many generals, the thought of Talpiot becoming the army's top priority was abhorrent. They needed fighters, they needed motivated young Israelis to fly planes and drive tanks, they needed boots on the ground, and they needed to secure the nation from the sea. Talpiot's recruiters were forced to jockey for position, smashing elbows with other officers representing other elite branches of the army. There was infighting, there was subterfuge. Bad and conflicting advice was given to potential recruits. Fortunately, the first commander of Talpiot was an indomitable personality, Dan Sharon. His war experience had taught him that there was a need for such a program well before the idea began taking off. On the first day of fighting in the Yom Kippur War, Egyptian warplanes fired Russian-made Kelt missiles at his base. The Kelts were precursors to today's cruise missiles, boasting pinpoint accuracy. Major Sharon saw some of the reserve foot soldiers who were on his base come up with a quick way to defeat and deceive the Celts by tapping into their Israeli radar systems that were on a similar frequency. I thought, why are these guys here? They should be at the Ministry of Defence. At this point, I knew we were wasting resources and needed to do better. Sharon was a long-time friend of Felix Dotan. They used to meet on Fridays for a spot of brandy. He was very eager to help Dotan, so when the program was finally accepted in 1978, Dotan asked him to lead Talpiot, and Sharon accepted. He had just completed his PhD dissertation at Hebrew University on the development of thinking and how one can improve his or her own thinking. In order to take the Talpiot position, however, the army had to reactivate him. They did so immediately with the higher rank of Lieutenant Colonel Sagan Aluf, executive officer of a brigade. Sharon looked to many places for help and advice. He'd never started a military unit before. Benny Peled, former chief of the Israeli Air Force and architect of the IAF's stunning defeat of the Egyptian and Syrian Air Forces in the Six-Day War, offered his services. Sharon recalls, Peled was always very positive, but critical and cautious at the same time. He always had a very sharp mind. He said to me, listen, 
When you construct a bridge, you always leave a weak spot where you can destroy the bridge with one single stick of dynamite if necessary. Maybe we are making a mistake, so don't forget. In case this program is unsuccessful, you need to get out. Sharon quickly discovered there would be bumps on the road, particularly in finding the super soldiers he needed for Talpiot. He discovered that he was in competition with a pre-existing elite computer and communications eavesdropping unit called Unit 8200 or 8200. Its recruiters were active precisely where Talpiot hoped to attract candidates. It became clear to us when we came to the field the guys from 8200 were already there and already had recruited. An unpleasant situation developed and I decided to solve this problem. There was a colonel in intelligence who was responsible for their training, Sasson Saik. At first, he didn't want to meet with me to discuss this issue, but ultimately he agreed. We sat in the Harley Cafe in Tel Aviv. I looked him straight in the eye. I told him this is about our existence here. Then I said, 